Hey, sixth grade, here we are back again with our part three of October Moon. So here we go. Chapter seven. Sitting on a dusty window ledge, hugging her knees to, close to her chest, Rachel stared down over the stables. Arc lamps had been fitted at either end of the long line of stables, painting the night in brilliant white light. She could occasionally see figures moving through the pools of light, one of whom she recognized as Summers. She wasn't sure, but she thought he was carrying a shotgun. She'd been moved to another bedroom, almost directly above her old room. It was small and rather sparsely furnished, and the bed creaked alarmingly when she sat on it. She'd tried lying down and sleeping, but she couldn't bear to close her eyes. She kept hearing the floorboards creaking when she and the ripping sound of the leather tearing. She knew if she closed her eyes, she would dream of slashing knives. She wanted to go home. Tears stung her eyes. She had never felt so frightened, so vulnerable in her life. She'd even bolted the door from the inside, and although the October night was unusually warm and close, she'd made sure that the window was firmly closed. Her father had tried to explain what was going on. Extortion, he called it. First the threats and then the demand for money. She shivered suddenly. The way her dad had been talking, this was only the beginning, whoever these people were, and she was sure that the red-haired boy and his sister were part of it. They were going to continue. They would keep coming back again and again until eventually her father paid up. And if he didn't, what would happen then? Rachel was climbing off of the window ledge when one of the arc lights blew out. She froze, blinking furiously to clear the after images of light that still burned on her retina. Ray's voices echoed flatly on the night air. She tried to make out what they were saying, but they were muffled by glass. She eased open the window, head turned to one side, listening. Summers was shouting instructions. There was a muffled explosion of glass, and the second arc light lamp died. A wisp of white smoke curled up from the broken light. There was a deadly silence, and then glass splintered close by, immediately followed by the rolling boom of a shotgun exploding across the night. She threw herself away from the window and scrambled across the floor on hands and knees. She heard the sound of breaking glass again, closer this time, and she looked up, and the bedroom window exploded above her head showering shards of glass across the floor. Something solid clumped onto the floor by her feet. Glass shattered in the rooms below her. Again and again, cowering behind the bed, she counted four, five, six. The shotgun fired again, and then silence. She, she sat up only when the cramped muscles began to twinge in her legs. Her foot nudged the object that had come through the window. Moving it on the floor wooden floor, Without thinking, she leaned forward to pick it up. It was a brick. Robert Stone snatched the plastic bagged brick from Inspector Lanigan's hand and waved it in front of her face. I suppose you're going to tell me my daughter threw these through the windows? Robert, Elizabeth, and Rachel Stone, along with Sean Summers, were gathered in the kitchen with the police inspector and a constable. It was one of the few rooms that wasn't littered with shards of broken glass. The big inspector looked at the pile of bricks and stones on the kitchen table, then carefully plucked the brick from Stone's hand and returned it to the pile. Seven windows in the east wing had been broken, as well as two arc lights. Some of the windows had been struck with two or three bricks, and the marble fireplace in the dining room had a deep scar on its glass-like surface where a chunk of rock had bounced off of it. Someone could have been killed, inspector. I'm aware of that, the police inspector said slowly, and he picked up one of the bricks and handed it to Robert Stone. How far could you throw that? Robert weighed the brick in his hand. Not far, he admitted. The inspector nodded again. Whoever threw these was close to the house, very close. Summers pushed himself away from the cooker. That's impossible. Billy and I were patrolling, on the, patrolling the stables. No one could have got past us. What passed for a smile crossed the inspector's broad face. One brick went through Miss Rachel's window. That's on the third floor, at least 35 feet off the ground. Even for someone standing very close to the window, it would have been difficult, to, a difficult shot. If you missed, the brick would have probably fallen back and brained you. Now, there's no way someone inside this, outside the stable area would have been able to heave a brick that far. 
Not unless they were very strong, Rachel said quietly. The inspector ignored the interruption. You fired twice, Sean. What were you shooting at? When the first arc light exploded, we thought it was just the bulb, but then the second light went. I heard glass breaking in the house at that same time, and I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. I fired instinctively. Did you hit anything? Lanigan demanded. We'll be having rabbit stew for supper, Summers, Sean, Summers said with a grin. You fired twice, the inspector repeated. What about the second shot? I thought I saw someone. He ran his hand across his bald head, wiping off droplets of sweat. I fired without thinking. It was probably just my imagination, though. You realize you'd be in serious trouble if you'd killed someone, Sean, Lanigan said grimly. I'd be obliged if you surrendered the weapon at the local station until this mess is cleared up. He was defending my property, Robert snapped. The law allows for reasonable force, Mr. Stone. I don't think a double-barreled shotgun could be considered, it could be classified as reasonable force. Well, what about the brick through the window, Inspector? What is that classified as? Stone demanded. The shotgun's legally held, Inspector, Summer said quickly. I don't see any reason to surrender it. If you shoot and wound someone with it, the charge will be attempted murder. If you kill someone, that charge will be murder. Think about that before you use it so freely next time. Next time, Inspector, Stone said icily. There's not going to be a next time, is there? I want police protection for me and my family. The inspector didn't reply immediately. He looked at the pile of bricks on the table, each one in a carefully tagged plastic bag. They would have to be sent up to Dublin for a forensic examination, though he doubted they'd find anything. I think what we have here, he said eventually, is a simple case of vandalism. It's unfortunate, of course, what with you being visitors to this country, but I'm sure it goes on even in your own country. I would certainly give you police protection, he continued, raising his hand for silence, if any of your lives had been threatened, but that hasn't happened. So you're going to do nothing? Elizabeth snapped. I'm sure whoever it was got a good fright when Sean loosed a fight loosened a few barrels at them. I doubt they'll be back. He glanced over his shoulder at the young constable and nodded at the bricks at the, on the table. The man came forward and began loading them into a thick satchel. Naturally, we'll keep an eye on the local hospital and we'll contact all the local doctors just in case they've treated anyone with a couple of shotgun pellets in, the, in them. He stretched out his hands towards Robert Stone, but the American refused to accept it and the inspector was forced to lower it, color flooding his cheeks. It's late now. I'll send one of my men around in the morning to collect some statements. I, I'll wish you all a good night. That's it? Robert Stone asked in astonishment. You're not going to do anything else? The inspector paused at the door. What else can I do, Mr. Stone? Someone threw stones at your window. Local lads with a few drinks in them, probably. I'll put word around. I'll see if I can find out anything. I'll try to make sure that it doesn't happen again, he added, stepping out into the kitchen yard and pulling the door closed behind him. Rachel wrapped her arms tightly around her body. She was beginning to realize that this was much more than a simple case of vandalism. This was much more serious and far more deadly. Thursday, October 29th. She was lying in the bath. The water had frozen solid and a thick crust of ice now held her body trapped beneath the surface, leaving only her head free. She was staring at the door, watching it vibrate in its frame with the force of the blows as someone standing in the bedroom struck it again and again. The wood split and the gleaming blade of a knife struck through. Another savage blow hacked off a long splinter of wood and the knife appeared again and again and again. She pounded frantically at the imprisoning ice with her fists. It cracked in long, jagged lines and then abruptly shattered in thousands of shards of sharp glass. She was lying in a bath of broken glass. Rachel jerked away with a tiny cry, the nightmare dissolving in the bright morning sunshine. Only the thumping sounds remained. It took her a few moments to realize that the sounds of hammering were coming from the rooms below. With a shuddering sigh, she lay back in the bed, blinking at the speckling of light across the ceiling as the e events of the previous night slid back into place. Another bedroom. She had spent three nights in this house and had slept in three different beds. 
This room was next to her parents. It was small and smelt with disuse, the air thick with whirling dust motes. She was sleeping on a narrow, uncomfortable camp bed, which Summers had brought in from the stables and carried up to the room. It smelt of straw and horses. We use it if we have to stay up all night with the horses, he explained. It's one of the, you know, if one of the mares is about to full, for example. I know you won't mind the smell. She'd been so tired then she would have gladly slept on the ground. Rachel sat up carefully, feeling the bed shift beneath her. A musty odor wafted up. She brought her sleeve to her nose and sniffed, wrinkling her nose at the smell of damp straw, old urine, and sour sweat. A few hours ago, the smell had been fresh and earthy, comforting too, as she had drifted off to sleep. She pulled strands out of her hair around in front of her face and breathed in the odor. It too smelt bitter with stale horse sweat. Rolling out of the low bed, Rachel grabbed her small bag of toiletries and padded down the hall to the bathroom. The sounds of hammering were louder now and she leaned over the banisters to look down at the hallway. She could see two workmen in the dining room, removing the remains of the shattered window, hammering out the bloke broken glass. Agnes worked behind them, sweeping up the splinters of glass. Rachel continued down the landing into the bathroom. The room had been decorated entirely in white, white tiles, white porcelain toilet, white sink. It looked and felt cold. She was surprised to find that there was no bath, but a shower stall had been fitted in one corner. Leaning on the sink, she stared at herself in the mirror cabinet, which had been fixed to the wall above it. She was shocked at her reflection. There were deep bluish rings beneath her bloodshot eyes, and her usually clear skin was smeared with dust motes from the small, dirty bedroom. The skin on her forehead was red and felt rough, and she knew, she just knew she was going to develop zits over the next few days. She spun the taps angrily. Nothing happened, but the pipes began clattering and clanking. While waiting for the hot water to come through, she crossed to the window, undid the catches, and pushed it open, allowing a little of the fresh morning air into the dry, disinfectant-smelling atmosphere of the small room. Resting her elbows on the window ledge, she leaned out the window and stared across the green fields to a distant line of trees. They looked almost black. For as long as she could remember, she had always wanted to visit Ireland. Now she wanted nothing more than to leave to return home where she felt safe. From the moment she had seen the burnt shell of the barn, she had felt intimidated. Though if she was asked, she couldn't exactly say why. She was turning away from the window when she looked down and discovered that the bathroom overlooked the stables, but from a slightly different angle than the bedrooms she'd slept in. From here, she could actually see into some of the stalls. A flash of red in the nearest stable caught her attention. The doors were open and she could see the vaguest suggestion of movement in the darkness beyond. She stared into the stable for close to five minutes and was just about to turn away when two people stepped out into the sunlight. Her breath caught at the back of her throat. It was the stable girl, Mauve, and the red-haired boy she'd chased. Now that she saw them together, the resemblance was unmistakable. She could tell by the boy's rigid stance and the girl's waving arms that they were having an argument. The girl rounded on the boy and poked him hard in the chest. Rachel saw him stagger back with one, with the force of the blows. The girl suddenly turned and stamped away, leaving the boy standing in front of the stables, his hands dug deep into his pockets of his ragged jeans. He was shaking his head and seemed to be muttering to himself. He pulled his right hand out of his pocket and rubbed at his chest, where Mav had jabbed him. Rachel felt a brief pang of sympathy for the boy, the girl obviously treated him badly. The tap suddenly spat water into the sink in a quick explosion of sound. The boy jerked his head up and looked straight into Rachel's eyes. The savage look on, of loathing on his face sent her scrambling from the window. Where's dad? Rachel asked as she stepped into the dining room. Her mother was just finishing breakfast. A copy of the Irish Times spread out before her. He's gone to Dublin, she said. He wanted to talk to some friends of his in the government and the police department. Elizabeth looked up from the paper. How'd you sleep? She asked. Rachel shrugged. I'm still tired, she muttered, and I ache everywhere. She sat down at the table, thought brief briefly about cornflakes, but settled on some dry toast and tea. Elizabeth Stone folded away the newspaper and dropped it on the floor beside her chair. 
Your father wants us to leave until this is, all this trouble is over, she said quietly. Rachel bit into her toast and said nothing. She felt a huge sense of relief, as if a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. He's afraid the situation might become more serious, Elizabeth continued. He spoke to a police officer in Dublin just this morning. The very, they very reluctantly agreed that it might be an, an attempt at extortion. They added that it might be a paramilitary organization who would want to cash, want the cash to buy arms. And they're far more dangerous than ordinary villains. Well, what are we going to do, Mom? I'm not going to leave your father alone, Elizabeth said simply. Will Dad leave? Elizabeth just laughed. I think he'd walk away from this place tomorrow if he could, but he's got this stubborn streak in him. You know that. And it upsets him to think he's being forced off of his own property. Well, when are we leaving? As soon as your father makes the necessary arrangements. There are a few contracts which need to be signed or canceled. However, you could always leave today or tomorrow. Rachel drank the lukewarm tea. I don't want to leave without you, she said quietly. Dad always said we should stick together. Elizabeth reached over and squeezed her daughter's hand. I know that, but this is a dangerous situation. These are dangerous people. Rachel put down the cup. But why haven't they gotten in touch, Mom? What's the point of terrorizing us if they don't demand money? I asked your father the same question. He says we're just being softened up. He's confident that they will we'll get the demand today or tomorrow. The sudden tension in her mother's fingers alerted Rachel to the fact that something was wrong. You're expecting something else to happen, aren't you? Elizabeth's grip tightened almost painfully on Rachel's fingers. All we're doing now is waiting for them to come again, and God knows what they'll do this time. The constant hammering drove Rachel out of the house. She drifted down to the stables, enjoying the smells and sounds of the horses. Summers tipped his hat as he walked past. Don't stray too far, miss, he said. I won't. She was walking past Eha's stable when the door opened and the stable girl, Mav, appeared. There was a bucket over her arm and she was carrying a stiff, bristled brush. Her clothes were peppered with wisps of straw. And before she realized what she was saying, Rachel turned to the girl. Mav, can I have a word with you? The girl walked past her. Stung by the deliberate snub, Rachel hurried after the girl. Caught her by the arm and attempted to spin her around. It was like trying to move a rock. The girl stopped and turned her head to look at Rachel, her bright green eyes glittering. I want to talk to you, Rachel snapped, anger making her voice high and shrill. Mauve looked into the other girl's eyes and a look of absolute contempt passed over her face. Have you got a problem? Rachel demanded, moving around to stand directly in front of Mauve. No problem. The girl's voice was surprisingly deep and husky. I've got work to do, she said, and walked around Rachel. Rachel glared at Mav's back. I want to speak to your brother. The girl stopped suddenly and turned around. She dropped the bucket and brush onto the ground and stepped right up to Rachel until their faces were only inches apart. What do you know about my brother? She demanded, her accent thick and brutal. She smelt of horse manure and damp straw. Well, I want to talk to him, Rachel said firmly, trying to disguise the tremble in her voice. Well, he doesn't want to talk to you, Mav snapped. Flecks of spittle splashing onto the younger girl's cheek. Stay away from him. Are you threatening me? Rachel asked in astonishment. Her thoughts were whirling. This couldn't be happening. Not here, not now. I'm advising you. Stay away from my brother. Well, I, I want to speak to him, Rachel persisted. My brother won't speak to you. Why not? The girl's breath was foul in Rachel's nostrils. Because he's dumb. He can't talk to anyone. Rachel walked the watched the red-haired girl stomp away. She was trembling and there was a sour taste in her mouth. The anger in the girl's eyes had been terrible. And for just a moment, she thought Mav was going to strike her. And why had she lied? Why had she said her brother was dumb? Rachel had seen them talking together. What were they hiding? Chapter 9. From the concealment of the long grass behind the stables, the figure watched the newcomer speaking to the red-haired girl. Although it couldn't make out what they were saying, it could sense the anger from, from them. And for a moment, it thought that Mav would strike the blonde girl. But then the moment passed and the red-haired girl stomped away. The other girl remained standing in the same spot for a few moments, breathing deeply, calming herself. And then she turned and headed back towards the house. The figure turned and looked at the house again. It would have to go back in. 
It would have to teach them the meaning of fear. Chapter 10. Rachel stumbled across the library almost by accident. It was on the ground floor, but right at the very back of the house, quite close to the kitchens. She had spent much of the afternoon wandering around the old house, opening doors, discovering a few surprises. A fully fitted nursery, complete with an, an enormous dollhouse. A small narrow room where the walls were completely covered with tiny, beautifully painted portraits. And a huge wine cellar. She had actually been coming up from the dusty cobwebbed cellar when she spotted the door, almost lost in the shadow thrown by the stairs. Entering the room was like stepping back into the past. Three of the walls were covered in bookshelves, tightly packed with books. Two long windows took up the fourth wall. Ivy-choked bushes grew tall and wild outside the windows, throwing the room into a green-tinged shadow. Rachel stepped into the library and closed the door behind her breathing in the dry atmosphere of dust and leather, of polish and decomposing paper. She pressed the light switch and a low wattage bulb flicked on. The girl walked slowly around the room, not touching anything, just simply looking at the shelves. Most of the books were bound in full leather. Rachel had always thought that leather was just one color, but now she realized that it ranged from a deep, almost black color to a light tan. There were white bindings amongst them too. She knew they were vellum, there were a few others in stipled, stippled cloth, and she guessed were buckram. Her father had a few fine books back at the apartment in New York, but they were mainly for show and investment. And although he was able to speak with great authority about the books in his small library, about the binding, the paper, the illustrations, she knew he was only repeating what he'd read in the catalog. She idly wondered how much this library was worth. Thousands, probably. Maybe hundreds of thousands. The room was bare except for a long, low table and an ancient leather swivel chair had been that had seen better days. The, the leather backing was dry and cracked, and the seat had caved in to a deep curve. Rachel sat in the chair and placed her hands on the table, looking around at the book-filled shelves. It was very easy to imagine one of the previous owners of the house sitting there, in this very chair, looking at the library, perhaps reaching out to pluck a book off the shelves to read through on some dark winter's night. A sudden thought struck her, and she realized that she knew absolutely nothing about the previous owners of Season Town House. Oh, she knew the jockey, Tommy Allen, had owned the house, but what about the people who had lived in it before him? She looked at the shelves again. If there was any information about the owners or about the house, surely it was here in this room. On impulse, Rachel swung around in the creaking chair to look at the shelves directly behind the desk. In a narrow bookcase between the two windows, at home, the books she used most frequently were on the shelf near her bed. She ran her fingers down the books on the shelves and nodded. These books had obviously seen more use than the others. The leather had, was stained dark with the grease of countless fingers, and blue ink had speckled the edges of one of the shelves. She plucked a long, narrow volume off the shelf and heaved it around the table. As she slapped it down, dust rose in a fine gray cloud, and she sneezed uncontrollably. When she opened the book, she discovered it was a series of daily accounts, starting in the year 1800. The last in the book was 1810. All the entries were in broad, flowing, spidery handwriting and almost impossible to read. She stood up and heaved the book back onto the shelf. There were 10 years accounts in this book, and, the, and there were at least another 20 books like it piled up on the shelves. She was looking at 200 years worth of work. A series of short, fat books next caught her attention, and she pulled out the nearest one. It was bound in dark leather, and there were four triangular pieces of metal on the corners of the covers. And a simple metal catch locked the covers together. When she put her book down on the table, the catch swung loose. The cover cracked as she opened it, and tiny flakes of gold leather speckled the table. Rachel carefully turned the brittle yellow page, brittle yellow paper. The flower had, that had been pressed in between the first two pages. Paper thin and tiny, it was still recognizably a buttercup. And below, it's, and below it was a name and a date in neat, precise writing. Piers de Courtney, 17th August, 1789. Rachel looked at it like something, 
looked at it in something like awe. Over 200 years ago, Piers de Courtney had plucked a flower, probably from the lawn outside, and carefully pressed it between these pages. She turned the page, and the corners flaking away at her touch, the, and discovered that the book was a diary. The pages covered in the same precise script. In places, the ink had faded to a rusty brown and was almost impossible to read. The first entry was for January 1st, 1789. We must give thanks that this day, the day, we must give thanks that this first day of the year of our Lord, 1789, has dawned without the howling storms that have kept us a virtual prisoner here since the eve of Christmas. Rachel carefully spelled out the words, squinting to make out the writing, but the letters were very faded. She turned to the back of the book, wondering if she, if the writing would be clearer. The last pages were blank, and she skipped back through the pages, looking for the last entry. She discovered it close to the middle of the book. This day, the 31st of October, All Hallows' Eve, the clan of Natalis came. There was no other entry. Puzzled, Rachel turned back to the shelves and pulled down another diary. It was in the De Court it was in De Courtney's handwriting, but finished on the 31st of December, 1788. The book beside it started in 1786 and finished on the 31st of December, 1787. The writing here was not quite so neat, the letters larger, and the book was speckled with ink blots. Rachel picked up the first book again. What had made a di uh, a diarist who had kept regular diaries for such a long period, decided to stop. She looked at the last entry again. The writing looked hurried, jagged, the letters biting deep into the page. The clan of Natalis came. Natalis didn't sound like an Irish name. Was it French? Italian? But then de Courtney didn't sound like an Irish name either. Could it be French or Norman? Hadn't Ireland been invaded by the Normans? She shook her head. She knew so little of Irish history. Rachel had picked up the diary again when the gong boomed close by, making her jump. She looked at the wristwatch, surprised to discover that it was nearly half past seven. She had spent the afternoon here. She stretched, easing her stiffened neck muscles, and then looked at her hands, which were filthy with the dirt and dust of the old books. The dinner gong boomed again. Still clutching the diary, Rachel hurried from the room, realizing that she had better wash her hands before she sat down for dinner. From the concealment of the bushes outside the window, cold green eyes watched the girl leave the library. The figure had been watching her since she had entered the room. It had memorized every detail of the girl. Her shimmering golden hair, it had never seen anything so bright. Her skin, so soft and clean, her eyes blue like the early morning sky. And when the girl sat at the desk, she was effectively hidden from the garden. And it had taken an enormous effort of will to remain in the bushes knowing that she was only a few feet away. The bell startled the figure, and it came alert, ready for flight. The bell had obviously summoned the girl, because when it rang again, she hurried from the room, pulling the door shut behind her. The figure in the bushes waited a few moments longer and then crept out of its hiding place and approached the windows. Chapter 11 Rachel stood in the doorway and felt her dinner heave in her stomach. She swallowed hard, desperately resisting the urge to vomit. She had returned to the library after dinner, drawn by curiosity, and when she turned the handle, the door opened a couple of inches and then stopped. Surprised, she pushed hard at the door and then heard something scrape across the floor. When she finally managed to push it open, wide enough to squeeze through, she discovered the room had been destroyed. All of the books had been pulled from the shelves and scattered across the floor. Most were in shreds and whiffs of paper still circled in the air. Heavy leather bindings had been torn off and snapped in half. The thick leather shredded, the paper crumbling to dust. The chair she'd been sitting in less than an hour before had been snapped in two and a pole punched through the seat. The leather backing hanging in long dangling strips. Wiry horsehair stuffing poked through the rents. The polished table was scarred by four long streaks slashed across the wood, and a broken light bulb swayed in its socket. Mom, Rachel said, but the sound came out in a hoarse whisper, and she swallowed hard. Mom, she tried again. Mom! 
This time it came out in a piercing scream that brought Rachel or that brought Elizabeth Stone running. At the same time, the door from the kitchen burst open and Sean Summers rushed out, a riding crop clutched firmly in his hands. Elizabeth gathered her daughter into her arms and held her while Summers stepped cautiously into the room, looking around in astonishment. The frenzied destruction shocked him. He picked up a binding that had been snapped in two and wondered at the great strength it would have taken to do that. When he traced the scars on the wooden table, he felt something cold slide down the back of his neck. The scratches matched the spread of his fingers. He thought of claws and shuddered. What happened here, Sean? Elizabeth Stone asked. The estate manager shook his head. I don't know, ma'am, he admitted, and he nodded at the open window. Someone entered through that window, he began, and then stopped. He ran his fingers down the side of the window frame, feeling the splintered ridges of wood. The lock had been torn off. The metal twisted and buckled. The glass cracked, and with a force of a, the blow leaning out of the window, he looked at the ground, but the hard, dry earth carried no tracks. When is Mr. Stone back, ma'am? He asked, turning back into the room. Elizabeth looked at her watch, squinting in the evening gloom. It was close to nine o'clock. I would have expected him back by now, she said, and immediately felt the first whis whispering butterflies of fear in the pit of her stomach. I'll phone him in the car, she said decisively. Summers nodded. Sh should we report this to the police? He wondered aloud, looking at the room again, shaking his head at the senseless destruction. Why bother, Elizabeth said bitterly. That inspector is certain Rachel's responsible. He'll be even more convinced if he learned that she discovered this. Summers lifted the book. Rachel recognized it as one of the accounts books that she had looked at earlier. The four inch thick book had been cleanly broken in half like a piece of wood. Miss Rachel didn't do this, ma'am. He attempted to break even one of the covers, but succeeded only in bending it slightly. Even Inspector Lanigan would have to admit that. Mr. Summers, Elizabeth said quietly, would you please check the rest of the house just in case there's an intruder hiding in one of the rooms? I'll phone my husband right now. Rachel, you come with me. Rachel nodded. She took a last look around the ruined library and wondered who or what could have done this amount of damage in such a short space of time. And she suddenly looked at the estate manager. Mr. Summers, how long were you in the kitchen? She, he looked surprised. I don't know how long exactly, miss. I came in for my dinner around half seven or so, he nodded. It must have been around then. Coronation Street was on TV. Rachel and Elizabeth looked at him blankly. Summers smiled sheepishly. It's a soap opera. It starts at half seven and finishes at eight. Well, did you hear anything, Mr. Summers? Rachel asked. Summers started to shake his head, and then he suddenly realized the point Rachel was making. Elizabeth Stone drew in a sharp breath, and then she too realized the implications of Rachel's question. Whoever had wrecked this room had done so in complete silence. Okay, guys, I'm stopping there, and we will pick this up again tomorrow.